hi guys it's me professor d and welcome back to my channel on this video i'm going to be covering stomach disorders you guys know what's coming up next if you haven't done so already please be sure to like and subscribe below so let's get started guys first question you're collecting initial assessment data for a client suspected of having acute gastritis what factor in this client's history may predispose the client to this disorder a, the client takes NSAIDs for arthritis pain. B, the client has an upper respiratory infection within the last two weeks. C, the client has a stressful job. Or D, the client enjoys spicy foods. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay guys, so the correct answer is A, that client is taking NSAIDs. NSAIDs are very, very hard on the stomach. They can cause ulcers. So that is the correct answer. Now let's look at our wrong choices. You have B, the client who had an upper respiratory infection within the last two weeks. That would not predispose a, a client to having gastritis. Now, uh, C and D, client that has a stressful job, and D, client that eats spicy foods. Now, if the client already has gastritis, you know, having, you know, being stressed, that can also um, give you an ulcer and make it worse. And of course, spicy foods will make it worse. But to predispose, that means something that can cause the patient to have a gastritis, which is, you know, that inflammation of the lining of the stomach, and NSAIDs. NSAIDs can cause and it can predispose a client to have gastritis. So that's the correct answer. Uh, next question. A client diagnosed with type B gastritis asks you to explain the cause of this disorder. What would be your best response? A, type B gastritis is an autoimmune cause. B, type B gastritis is the result of chemical ingestion. C, type B gastritis is associated with H. pylori. Or D, type B gastritis is caused by visceral afferent nerve stimulation. And the correct answer C, guys, type B gastritis is associated with Helobacter pylori, which is H. pylori. That's a type of gram-negative um, bacteria. So for a patient that has a type of gastritis, which is type B, which is the H. pylori, um, in addition to PPI or H2 block or maybe even both, in addition to that, the patient will also need an antibiotic because remember what I told you, H. pylori is a gram-negative um, organism, a gram-negative bacteria, so the patient will need an antibiotic in addition to the PPI, the H2 blocker, or maybe both combined. The client presents to the clinic with suspected gastritis. What data from the client would indicate the client suffers from chronic gastritis? A, the client reports two episodes of hematemesis. B, the client reports severe lower abdominal discomfort. C, the client reports the abrupt onset of vomiting five hours after eating. Or D, the client reports epigastric pain that is relieved by ingestion of food. You guys know I love my coffee. So guys, the correct answer is D, the client reports epigastric pain that is relieved by ingestion of food. So what happens is the patient's got this inflammation of the stomach caused by all that hydrochloric acid, right? But once the patient eats food, the hydrochloric acid stops eating away at their stomach lining because there's food in the stomach. So what's it breaking down? It's breaking down the food instead of that patient's own stomach lining. So that is the correct answer. Um, food um, decreases um, the amount of hydrochloric acid, number one, that is released. And it also gives the hydrochloric acid something to eat away at. So it breaks down that food instead of the patient's own stomach lining. A client with a gastric ulcer develops a sudden sharp pain in the mid-epigastric region. Upon assessment, you note that the abdomen is tender and rigid. What is your best first action? A, increase the IV fluid rate. B, notify the doctor. C, place the client in knee chest position. Or D, prepare to administer an H2 blocker. So the correct answer, guys, 
is notify the physician. And I talked to you about this before. Whenever you see an answer choice of notify the physician, you should always say to yourself, is there anything else on this list? Are there any other choices that are something that I can do for this patient to help them, to save them before I turn my back to call the doctor, right? But when you look at this list, everything else is wrong. You have no choice. You have to call the doctor because what's happening here is a medical emergency. You're suspecting that that patient's bleeding out due to perforation. Let's look at, let's look at the hints that we got. First of all, they let us know that the patient has a gastric ulcer. Whenever a patient has an ulcer, that ulcer is at risk for what? Bleeding, okay? That's our first hint. Second, sudden. If you guys watch my priority and delegation video and I go over the NCLEX tips on how to pass NCLEX, I was very clear. When you see that word sudden, you better be running to that patient. That's a hint letting you know something's severely wrong, right? We see sudden or we see severe, we're like, ah! and we're running to that patient. That was our second here. Sudden, and it didn't even say pain, right? Look at the adjective they put before pain. Sharp pain. Another adjective you better be running to is when you see that word severe. So we have three hints already. Let's keep going. And they say the abdomen is tender and rigid. What's another way for saying rigid? Board-like? Why do you think that abdomen's rigid? Why do you think it's bored like? Why do you think it's hard? Because of all that blood accumulation. That's why. That patient is bleeding out. Okay? We had perforation. Now that patient's bleeding out. This is a medical emergency. You have to call the doctor because guess what? That patient's going to be rushed to the OR. There's absolutely nothing you can do for that patient except get that patient to OR so that patient can have surgery immediately. So this is the, that's why uh, B is the correct answer. Which of the following nursing diagnoses would be considered a priority for the client with a peptic ulcer disease? A, acute pain. B, ineffective coping. C, potential for metabolic alkalosis. Or D, ineffective therapeutic regimen management. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay guys, the correct answer is A. Acute pain. Gastric ulcers are very, very painful. Now, you know, I've talked about this before. I'm like, pain never killed anybody except for four circumstances where pain is a priority. What are those? Burn, sickle cell. What are my pain? Burn, sickle cell, stones, and myocardial infarction. So obviously, um, peptic ulcer is not on this list, but let's look at our other choices. Because our other choices are absolutely wrong, that's what makes pain the right answer, okay? Choice B, ineffective coping. That's psychological, okay? And um, yes, we care about the psych aspect, but when it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the psych aspect is very, very high. It's not towards the bottom, towards physiological integrity, where when a patient's in pain, what can pain cause? It can cause the um, rate of the respirations to increase. It can cause the blood pressure to increase. It can cause the heart rate to increase, right? So we're going to get rid of ineffective coping. That's not a priority when you compare it to pain. Choice C potential for metabolic alkalosis. Let me tell you something. Whenever you guys get a question and they ask you what's a priority, your priority is always going to be something that's happening with the patient right now. It's never going to be a potential or a risk for. The only time they ask you about a priority and you choose a risk for or potential something that can possibly happen is if all of the choices are potential or risk for. So that way, you know, you have no choice. You got to choose one, right? Other than that, if you're asked a priority question, you better always choose something that's going on with the patient right now. We don't have time to worry about what may happen to them in the future. We want to deal with what's happening right now. So we're going to get rid of uh, choice three just because it said potential. Okay. Choice four, ineffective therapeutic regimen management. Well, there's nothing in the question that even tells us that the patient's not taking the meds the way they're supposed to. So that is what makes A the correct answer out of the choices that we're giving to us. A client with a gastric ulcer and H. pylori infection is being treated with triple therapy, bismuth, metrid metron guys, you know I can't pron pronounce, metronid metronidazole, and amoxicillin and renatidine. That's your Zantac. The client asks why Zantac is necessary because the triple therapy will treat the cause of the ulcer. What is your best response? 
A, renatidine will help to heal the ulcer and prevent recurrence. B, renatidine is a potent antibiotic used to eliminate H. pylori infection. C, renatidine dissolves the stomach and coats the ulcer so it'll heal faster. Or D, renatidine will help control diarrhea that can result from triple therapy. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, and the correct answer is A, guys. Renatidine will help heal the ulcer and prevent recurrence. And that's why that med is given with your triple meds for the H. pylori. Now, let's look at our other wrong choices. So I, I want you to understand why they're wrong. You have choice B. Renatidine is an antibiotic used to eliminate H. pylori. That's false. Renatidine, also known as Zantac, that's the H2 blocker. It's an H2 antagonist. It is not an antibiotic, so that's wrong. Then you have choice C, renatidine dissolves the stomach and coats the ulcer so that, so that it will heal faster. Well, caraphate does that. Caraphate, you know, it coats the stomach and that helps healing, okay? Renatidine, guys, you guys know I can't even talk. Zantac does not do that. Um, choice D, Zantac will help control diarrhea that can result from triple therapy. Uh, no, that medication bismuth, that is an anti-diarrheal. And so let me um, kind of touch up on this so you guys can understand. Why would the patient get um, diarrhea from this therapy? Why would we have to give an anti-diarrheal? Well, any patient that's getting um, high-dose antibiotics or if they're getting antibiotics for a prolonged amount of time, um, it kills the normal flora in the gut and it can cause the patient to have diarrhea, okay? Also, our, the C. diff, which guys, that C. diff is the smelliest thing ever. If you guys have ever had the scent of a patient with C. diff, you will never forget it and you'll recognize it immediately. And that can happen when a patient's taking either high-dose antibiotics or antibiotics for an extended amount of time just because of the normal flora that's being killed in the gut. All right, next question. A client's been prescribed an antacid for the treatment of a duodenal ulcer. What instructions regarding this medication should you give to this client? A, take the antacid two hours before meals. B, take the antacid one hour before meals. C, take the antacid two hours after meals. Or D, take the antacid only when you have pain. And the correct answer is C, take the antacid two hours after meals. Now remember, what is an antacid? What is the mechanism of action? Antacids neutralize, okay, the acidity in the stomach, those gastric contents. So it helps to bring healing to the stomach. Now it's very important, guys, when it comes to stomach disorders, those meds such as your your caraphate, sucrophate, your H2 blockers, your PPIs, you absolutely, and of course your antacids, you absolutely must know the mechanism of action because I promise you, you'll get at least one question asking you the mechanism of action of a certain drug and they'll give you the mechanism of action of all the other drugs. And so you have to know the difference. So you have to know how these drugs work, okay? So anyway, the correct answer is C and the reason that the patient takes it two hours after the meals. I want you to think about it. Where's the ulcer? It's in the duodenum, not the stomach, okay? So it takes time to go from that stomach to the small intestine. And so that's why you have them take it two hours after the meal because you need it to be able to neutralize that acid. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. Choice one and two, wrong. Antacid before meals. What's the antacid going to neutralize if there's no food there? There's, there's no acid. It makes no sense. You're going to do it afterwards. So that's wrong. And then you have D, take the antacid only when you have pain. No, that's wrong. You're going to take the antacid as ordered. And it's going to be the two hours after meal for a certain amount of time until the patient's healed and the doctor uh, discontinues the medication. A client with a history of heart failure has been prescribed an antacid for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. What instructions should you include when teaching the client about antacids? A, some antacids contain a high sodium content. B, some antacids could potentiate digoxin toxicity. C, some antacids could use, can cause potassium depletion. 
Or D, some antacid could trigger irregular heartbeats. And the correct answer, guys, is A, some antacids contain a high sodium contact, content, excuse me. Some antacids such as like aluminum hydroxide has a high sodium content. Well, why is that important to us? Go back to the question and it says the patient has heart failure. When a patient has heart failure, they're holding on to too much fluid. That's what caused the heart to fail in the first place. So that patient's going to be on diuretics because we're trying to get rid of the fluids. Do we want that patient ingesting anything with a high sodium content? Remember, fluids follow sodium. So the more sodium that patient holds on to, the more fluid they're going to hold on to. The more fluid they hold on to, the weaker the heart is going to be. So that's why it's important for um, the patient to know that some antacids have a so high sodium content. You know, they put heart failure in that um, scenario for a reason. You should have asked yourself, well, you know, why did they let us know this patient has heart failure? Whatever's going on, it has something to do with the heart, right? That was your hint and that's the correct answer. A client being treated for peptic ulcer disease reports drinking four cups of decaf coffee each day. What is your best response? A, you may drink decaf coffee only with meals. B, you should avoid both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee. C, drinking decaffeinated coffee is correct, but limit your intake to two cups per day. Or D, you should drink coffee only within one hour of taking your anti-ulcer medication. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So the correct answer, the only correct answer here, guys, is B. You should avoid both caffeinated and decaffeinated beverages. Why? Because they contain peptides which increase the production of hydrochloric acid, right? We need less acid in this type of patient, not more. And so that's why B is the correct answer. A client with peptic ulcer disease has developed upper gastrointestinal bleeding, has chills, and has become diaphoretic. Upon assessment of vital signs, you note that the pulse to be 94 and thready and blood pressure 100 over 50. What is your best first action? A. Document the finding as the only action. B. Notify the healthcare provider. C. Check placement of the NG tube. Or D, place the client on the side in the left lateral decubitus position. And the correct answer is B, notify the physician. With the scenario that's been given to us, there is nothing else that you can do for this patient except notify the doctor so we that patient can um, go um, into surgery. That patient needs help right away. This patient's going through shock. From what? They're bleeding out. How do we know this? Let's go back to the question because they gave, gave us lots of hints. The first thing they told us was the patient that had a peptic ulcer. And again, any patient with an ulcer is at risk for what? Bleeding, right? Keep that in mind. Let's keep moving. Then they told us that the patient has developed upper GI bleeding. They even let us know that patient's bleeding. All right, let's keep going. They're having chills and becoming diaphoretic, so they're sweating, right? What else is going on? Their pulse is thready. What does that mean? It's weak. What else is going on? Blood pressure, 100 over 50. That blood pressure is down and the pulse is thready. What do you think that's a sign and symptom of? Shock, bleeding out. You better call the doctor. That patient's going to go into surgery immediately. That is the only action that you can do with... Um, the choices that have been given to us for this patient. That patient is going through shock. This is a medical emergency, okay? A client's been admitted with peptic ulcer disease and develops abdominal distension and nausea and vomiting of undigested food after eating breakfast. What intervention should you prepare to implement for this client? A, insertion of NG tube. B, insertion of jejunostomy tube. C, administration of antiemetic. 
Or D, administration of an H2 blocker or H2 receptor, receptor antagonist, same thing. And the correction got, the correction, the answer guys is A, insertion of an NG tube. What do we suspect is happening here? A pyloric obstruction. How do we know this? Let's go back to the question. Let's look at the hints that they gave us to let us know that this is most likely what's happening. Abdominal distension. Guys, when you eat, the food's supposed to go from your stomach to the small intestine, right? But we see abdominal distension, so that stomach's getting bigger, bigger, which lets us know that food really isn't going anywhere, is it? B, nausea and vomiting. Why are they feeling so full? Well, shoot, I just gave you the answer. Why do they have that nausea and vomiting? <laughs> they have that nausea and vomiting because they're feeling so full, bloated, right? Remember, they told us um, increased abdominal girth. So that's our second um, hint. Undigested food. Food's supposed to be digested and go to the small intestine for further digestion, right? That's our third hint. You should suspect pyloric obstruction. So what are you going to do? You're going to prepare to, you expect the doctor to give you an order for NG2 placement and you're going to put it there, put it in there. Why? Because you want to decompress the stomach. And that's why we put NG tubes in the first place for decompression. And that's exactly what this patient needs. All of the, cho the, the other choices are wrong. A client underwent a Bill Rock II procedure a week ago for the treatment of duodenal ulcer. Which of the following clinical manifestations should alert you to the late manifestation of dumping syndrome? A, severe abdominal pain and strong desire to defecate. B, epigastric distension and abdominal cramping. C, a mouth dryness and palpitation. Or D, dizziness and palpitation. Now, I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is D, dizziness and palpitations. So um, the question is a late signs and symptoms of dumping syndrome. We expect to see that about one and a half to three hours after the patient eats, okay? And those signs and symptoms are your dizziness, your palpitations, confusion, sweating, okay? Those are the signs and symptoms of dumping syndrome. By the way, guys, whenever you guys get a question about a patient that had a Bill Roth procedure done, Two things need to be at the forefront of your mind. One is dumping syndrome, and two is um, uh, the signs and symptoms of um, what is it? The signs and symptoms of decreased B12. Why? Remember the Bill Roth procedure. What's happening? They're taking a very large portion of the stomach. They're removing it. Well, guess what is in that stomach? Intrinsic factor, that's where it's made. So when they remove that portion of the stomach, patients are unable to have that intrinsic factor and they're gonna to need to get an outside source, an exogenous source of vitamin B12 for the rest of their lives, okay? That is very important. So whenever you see Bill Roth too, those are two things that need to be going through your mind. You need to be thinking of B12 due to not having enough intrinsic factor and you need to be thinking of dumping syndrome okay so for this question the correct answer is d and we expect to see those signs of symptoms about um an hour and a half to three hours after the patient's eaten after being discharged home the family of the client who had undergone a bill Roth II procedure reports that the client has that that reports that the client's tongue has taken on a shiny, beefy appearance. What conclusion can you draw from this information? A, the client requires further instruction regarding post-op oral hygiene. B, the client is exhibiting symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. C, the client has developed protein calorie malnutrition. Or D, the client's exhibiting symptoms of alkaline reflux. So I guess I got ahead of myself and gave you the answer. So the, you guys know what the correct answer is. It's B, the client's exhibiting signs and symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency, such as what? That red beefy tongue. And they didn't say red beefy tongue, but they said a uh, shiny beefy appearance of the tongue. That's a sign and symptom of decreased B12. And remember that decreased B12 
is due to the lack of intrinsic factor. That lack of intrinsic factor is due to portion of that stomach being removed. What statement, what statement made by the client preparing for hospital discharge after surgery for peptic ulcer disease indicates a need for further teaching? A, I will eat small frequent meals. B, I will avoid products that contain aspirin. C, I will eliminate alcoholic beverages from my diet. D, I will, make, I will take my medication until the heartburn is gone. And the correct answer is D, I'll take my medication until the heartburn is gone. We're looking for an answer that requires further teaching. That means which one is wrong and D is wrong. They're not only going to take their medication until the heartburn is gone. They're going to take their medication every day as ordered until the doctor discontinues that medication. So that's the one that's wrong. Everything else is right. We want that patient to have small frequent meals. We want them to avoid uh, meds containing aspirin. We don't want them bleeding out. They're already at risk for bleeding because because of the ulcer and choice D um, alcohol we want them to stay away from alcohol because alcohol exacerbates the ulcer and can cause bleeding okay so the correct answer is D next question you're taking the initial history from a client with Zollinger Ellison syndrome what clinical manifestation would you expect this client to report a diplopia B statery and diarrhea C, hyperglycemia, or D, shortness of breath? And the correct answer, guys, is B, statorrhea and diarrhea. So statorrhea is um, fatty stools, and you know what diarrhea is, that watery, loose stools. So why do we expect to see that in this type of patient? Well, what happens is that increased hydrochloric acid production when it goes into the duodenum, it decreases the pancreatic lipase. And remember, what does the pancreatic lipase, those enzymes, what do they do? Break down fat. So if that fat isn't broken down, guess what you're going to see? You're going to see that fat in the stools, and that's how you see the um, statorrhea and, of course, the diarrhea. A Japanese client with a family history of gastric carcinoma asks you about primary prevention of the disease. What is your best response? A, there's no genetic basis for the developing gastric cancer. B, you have an esophageal gastroduodenoscopy yearly. C, gastric cancer is associated with salted or pickled and salted foods. Or D, gastric cancer can be avoided by a diet high in vegetables and vitamin C. And the correct answer, guys, is C, gastric cancer is associated with salted or pickled and salted foods. Why? Those foods are, um, are very acidic. And one more thing that also can place the patient at risk, foods that are high in nitrates. Okay, so let's look at our, our wrong answer choices. You have A, there's no genetic basis for developing gastric cancer. Well, that's wrong. People, we find that um, people from Japan, people from Costa Rica, people from Chile have a higher incidence of gastric cancer. Um, choice B, you have an EGD yearly that doesn't prevent the patient from getting cancer. It can detect it earlier, but it doesn't prevent, so that's wrong. And then you have choice D, gastric cancer can be avoided um, by a diet high in uh, vegetables and vitamin C. A diet high in uh, vegetables and uh, vitamin C, while that is desired, that's a great thing for the patient to do, that will not um, keep the patient from getting gastric cancer. Um, we're down to our last question, guys. So last one, a client, with a client with diagnosed gastric carcinoma has undergone treatment with radiation therapy. For what possible side effects from this treatment should you be alert? A, radiation-induced hypermotility. B, fatigue and anorexia. C, capillary leak syndrome. Or D, gastric dilation. 
And the correct answer, guys, is B, fatigue and anorexia. After radiation treatment, the patient is very, very, very tired, and they don't want to eat. They just want to rest. They don't want to eat as, at all. Another thing we see with those patients that have a radiation um, nausea and vomiting, right? Nausea and vomiting goes with everything and diarrhea. Okay. So guys, I hope that this video was helpful to you. I, I hope that I brought some clarification when it comes to gastric disorders and you got something out of this video. So guys, if you felt that you did, I'm asking that you please support me, support this channel by sharing it, sharing it with any friends or anyone, you know, that would benefit from my videos. Um, also, of course, Go ahead, like and subscribe and press that red button. That red button, that's a notification button. So every time a new video is released, you will be notified. Guys, thank you for spending this time with me and I'll see you next time.